Well, guys, um, I want to, today I'm going to introduce Ryan Zeke, but the last three days he's been in my care, as the campaign calls it. And I want to tell you, you guys talk about firing your belly to run for a statewide office. Let me just give you a recap of what we've done in the last three days. We started off Tuesday morning at the Mighty Mo. Um, it was a great radio show. They did it about 20 minutes. 20 to 30 minutes with them. We had a fundraiser later on that day. Standing room only at Jorgensen's. It was packed. Jorgensen was packed with people for Ryan Z. He went on to the Helen Chamber banquet. Of course, I like to think everybody came to see Ryan, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's what I think. That's what I'm telling the campaign crew. We started off uh, Wednesday morning. We had uh, breakfast at Steve's Cafe. We went over to Sun Mountain Lumber and toured Sun Mountain Lumber and listened to the, the concerns of the lumber industry. And, and uh, there's a <laughs> Great mill, 150 people working all live in Deer Lodge. It's essential to Deer Lodge. And listen to their concerns. And they're going all the way to Laramie, Wyoming to get lumber. They're traveling past millions of acres of dead trees to get lumber, to get trees all the way down there. I just think we can do better. That's what I walked away with. Then we went from Deer Lodge up to Shelby. Had a fundraiser in Conrad. People packed into a snowmobile shop. But I swear they're all here to see Ryan. Packed into a snowmobile shop on a Wednesday afternoon in, in Conrad, and then we went up to Shelby, had a fundraiser in the Shelby Chamber. The governor came up. The roads were so bad that the governor's plane still sitting in Shelby, and they sent some, some highway patrols up to get him to haul him back down because the roads were it's really bad up there. On Great Falls North, it's just, there's a lot of snow. It took us about four hours to get home. So I am so happy that after this, I relinquished Sinky to go on to a couple of and go back to my normal life. So I want to introduce you to one of my better friends. And one of the things I want to just briefly talk about. Yesterday we at Steve's Cafe, we ran into, into Eric Fever. And I was, Eric Fever has already endorsed on this house race. And he's never talked to anybody. Never talked to any of the candidates on the Republican side. Zinke here was chairman of the House Education. We took votes against his caucus for teachers and didn't even talk to him. I just think that's wrong. That, that's one of the things I want to sum up there. I want to introduce Ryan Zinke. He's a third generation Montana. He grew, comes up from us from uh, Whitefish. His family goes back to eastern Montana, Fort Benton, and, and Ricky. And when he was in Whitefish, he was an Eagle Scout. He was an All State football player. High school, graduated the University of Oregon with honors. Uh, the Emerald Cup of Academic, Athletic, and Leadership Excellence, pretty big honor. Attended Naval Academy, Candidate School, commissioned in 85, was elected, selected for Navy SEAL training. There, he served with distinction for 23 years, overseas deployments, and hundreds of combat missions. On SEAL Team 6, he was team leader, task force commander, special operations officer, among some of the toughest jobs in the military. In his, in his spare time while he was doing all that, he earned a master's degree from the University of San Diego and an MBA from the National University, which is, I mean, that's no family time, that's no weekends, that's a lot of work to do what he did. Twice awarded the Bronze Star for his actions in combat. He retired in 2008, was elected to the Montana legislature, served for one term as a senator, and today he's running for Congress, and I want to introduce my friend, Ryan Zink. I won't use the mic, but why would anyone want to run for Congress? Well, let's look at what's, what's going on in our country. We've all heard about Obamacare. We've all heard the government spent about a billion dollars. Three years, and the first day, six people sign up. We were also told that if you wanted to keep your doctor, you could. If you wanted to keep your insurance, you could. That was a lot. Mr. Clapper, who I know, enters before the Congressional Committee and he says, we're not spying on American citizens. Two weeks later, every email, every phone call that you've done the last two years has been neatly tucked away in a database. That was a lot. The IRS, if they don't like you, they're free to harass you, intimidate you. Senior IRS officials take the fifth amendment, get promoted. 
list goes on. Now, I think it's time to stop making promises we can't keep and let's tell the truth. Let's tell the truth. So what is the truth in America? Seventeen and a half trillion dollar debt. And rising. Labor force, 80 million Americans are out of the labor force. 47 million Americans are on food stamps. A third of Americans can't pay their bills. 50% of college graduates can't find a job in their vocation. And worst of all, we don't trust our government. Do you? I mean, is anyone? So what has happened to America? What's happened to D.C.? And it doesn't seem like we can stop the downward spiral no matter who we send to D.C. The Republicans haven't stopped it. The Democrats haven't stopped it. The Tea Party hasn't stopped it. And that's why I'm running. In the military, when all else fails, you send in the Navy SEALs. <laughs> <laughs> and I think it's time to send the Navy SEALs to Washington, D.C. <laughs> a little about my background. <clears throat> my family, my, my grandmother, she was 14, left home. <clears throat> She was a one-room school teacher outside of Richmond. My grandfather helped build the Fort Peck Dam. My father was the youngest plumber in Montana's history, master plumber, 17. My daughter I told her two things in life. Don't join the Navy and don't marry a Navy suit. <laughs> She's a Navy diver. He married a Navy SEAL. <laughs> He's on his eighth deployment overseas. Myself, I spent 23 years in the SEALs, <clears throat> fought in Kosovo and Iraq. I can tell you the SEALs do one thing really well, is we define a mission. And my mission is this. I want to restore America and restore Montana to the place that I grew up in. And what was that place that we grew up in? For hard work, initiative, self-reliance, that was valued. <coughs> when your neighbor's barn was on fire, you didn't care whether he was a Democrat, Republican, or Libertarian. You put it out because that was the right thing to do. In combat, I didn't care if it was a Democrat next to me, a Republican, I didn't care. What I cared about was he or she did their job well. Government was trusted. And when it came to welfare or public services, it was the last option and not the first. But it was there. And the American dream of having a good job own your own home, and send your kids to college, that was real. It's not real when a third can't pay their bills. But is it fixable? Yes. I believe it is. And how do we do it? I spent the last couple months talking to key industry leaders around the country that have a vested interest in Montana. And the conclusion is this. We need to get government out of business. The budget was the great compromise between Ryan and Murray. $23 billion over 10 years was the cut. That's not a cut. Sequestration, whether you agree with it or not, was $85 billion. We can't cut our way out. We can't tax our way out. So the only way we can do it is grow our way out. 
And the first step is we need to get government out of business. That doesn't mean we don't respect clean air, clean water, but government shouldn't be picking winners and losers. And government shouldn't be bailing out big business. And government shouldn't be harassing small business. And they are. Secondly, energy independence. I'm a former geologist. In my lifetime, I never thought we could do it. I can tell you, as a father, I don't want to see my kids be deployed overseas. I don't want to see your kids deployed overseas for a commodity that we have here. I can tell you, if the United States Navy were to leave the Persian Gulf today, you could not get a co-op out of the Persian Gulf without the Somalian pirates having everything. We as a nation can be energy independent. And we have to stop the war on fossil fuels. My record is clear. All energy sources have a play. But gas reserves in this country are oil and Montana coal is a piece of that problem. And it is likely the largest piece. You cannot power this country on pixie dust and coal. Cheap, abundant energy will bring back manufacturing. And the social problems we talked about, if you have a good job, I can tell you it goes a long way to solving a lot of our social problems. Because at home, if you don't have a good job, both parents are working, you look right now across our state, the number of Montanans that are working the bucket, oil patch, so where are the kids? Or dropped off at grandma's house, <coughs> a lot of stress in the house. Now that's one of the barriers. And a good job and a good education, which are related, that goes a long way. And lastly, we got to bring truth, grace, and I do say grace, and trust and honor back to D.C. Our country was based on truth. It was country that was based on a Judeo-Christian values where the truth matters. And you know what? The truth does matter. Because you can't solve problems if your basis for a reference point is what you can get away with with the poll. And both sides are guilty. And we're guilty for letting it happen. Our political process demands that we all participate. Otherwise, we get what we get. We get a government that's out of control. And we get a reference point that is again based on hope. Our reference point has to be based on truth and the Constitution. And imagine if you say, I'm a constitutionist. You're labeled as some radical. I was proud to defend the Constitution against all enemies, foreign and domestic, because it matters. So as a former SEAL, the SEAL Team 6 commander, I can tell you I was feared. The enemy feared me. And it wasn't just because we had good equipment, and good training, you know, marginal leadership. <laughs> it was because of what we stood for. We stood for our values. We stood for the American values. They're better. America is the light of the world. Our system is the better system, where everyone has a voice. Well, my mission, although I've been on some pretty tough missions in my life, I don't think there is no more, no more important than this one. Because I'm trying to do three things. I'm trying to fix a Republican Party that circles the wagons and shoots in. I'm trying to bring the East and the West of Montana together. I'm 
trying to save my country. I think the first is probably the toughest job. The Republicans are serving the wagons and shooting them. And I know that all of you are not Republican. But I'll leave you this. If I didn't think that it was fixable, if I didn't think we could make a difference and we move the needle, I wouldn't vote for that. I live a pretty happy life. And run for politics. be the happy candidate. <laughs> we're we're going to run with Reagan's 11th commandment. I'm not going to say anything ill to fellow Republicans. We're not going to hit the Democrats. We're going to go on American values. And as a football game, if you watch football, we're going to go right off, right tackle. We'll write a center, but not in the sidelines. <laughs> <laughs> Oddly enough, the, the, the great Super Bowl coming up, you know, we look at numbers all the time. And Montana is fascinating on, on, on the Super Bowl. The 25% of Montanans that I, I, I support the Denver Broncos. Good man. Now, <laughs> so where did that 25% come from? Mostly the middle. Mostly, mostly the middle. That's, that's the Billings. Seahawks, mostly on, 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 on the West. You know, it would make sense with, uh, with Missoula. <laughs> and then uh, the, the third is, 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 uh, is the Vikings. The Vikings still have a good crowd. They're, they're, they're way over by Glenn Dutch. <laughs> but I, I thought it was not as far that this Super Bowl is really between the East and West once again. <laughs> but thank you uh, for allowing me to talk. And uh, certainly thank you for, uh, for your friendship. I, I know most of you. And, uh, I'm looking forward, you know, to uh, the campaign. Because again, we're going to be the happy campaign, and uh, I, I look, I look forward to, to, to listening to you and, and answering questions. And uh, we'll talk about the truth. Uh, I've advised, you know, my staff not to shut any bridges down on Frost, and, and uh, again, we're going to be happy. So I'll take questions. Okay. Anybody have any questions? Here's your opportunity to put him on the spot. Well, in education, you talk about better education. A lot of it is getting the right education for replacing jobs that are needed. Big manufacturers are all saying young people they get aren't trained. Well, I think that's something you need to emphasize more than just getting education. Everyone's saying, uh, the president says, everyone needs a college education. Well, you don't need a college education to be a good plumber or a good electrician or a lot of good carpenter, but you do need a good technical education for a lot of the jobs now in industry. There, you're handling machines worth 10, 20 million dollars. You don't turn a jackass with a philosophy degree over to run that. <laughs> Let's take a look at, at the uh, lumber mill down there. The average age of a guy in Florida down there is probably 62. So their workforce is pretty old. Uh, and I asked them, you know, what are the problems, how's the education? And said, you know what, we have jobs available. We can't, we can't get the kids, and they're mostly kids at the young entry level. We can't get them to stay. They'll come and work, work a few days, and they'll leave. I work in the gun manufacturing industry, our help out. And uh, let's take an example of uh, Montana Firearms. It's a little company in, in the Flathead Valley. They have about 60 employees, half the employees, it's a full spectrum. Some, some of them are on machines that are you know, expensive and need programming experience. Half the guys on the floor don't have a high school education, a high school diploma. So, you know, Montana, we <coughs> like to think that we're a state of hard-working, well-educated workforce. Um, how many are in business here? And then how many will say that's true? You know, of the, of the applicants that you go through, even McDonald's. I was talking to the, the individual that owns the McDonald's in, in Billings and around. He goes, well, you know what? Out of 100 applicants, 
you would think anyone can work at McDonald's, right? Right. 100 applicants, 15. 15 out of 100 are accepted. That's about the same attrition as SEAL training. <laughs> so our education system, I think competition is good. But I think you also have to be transparent and make sure that you're accountable to the taxpayer dollars. <coughs> I do think that Christian schools have done a good job of providing, you know, competition because competition in the market is good. But also, you know, our public school system, I don't want to dismantle it. I want to give them the tools that they can compete. Well, if you're a teacher, you know, you can't, you can't, it's very difficult about portability. If your spouse moves, you know, it's hard to, to, for you to move. I think you're locked in in a pension system that if you want to teach for 15 years and leave because you want to do something else, start a business, or you're just tired of, of the eighth grade you know, class, I, I think you should be able to leave with, with, a, with a type of a pension, you know, on the 401k. It's more of a state issue. As a former chairman of the, of the Senate Education, you know, I, I could have my choice uh, of what I did. And, uh, I was a former dean of, of special operations, the graduate school. And then we looked at computers and, and how to integrate, be innovative in the classroom. 23 of the courses were college level. Uh, so I'm passionate about education. And, and ed education is a difficult subject because it's not just one variable. You look across Montana, I go back to jobs. We go back to Montana, if, if the kid has no parent, that means Who's going to help with all? You know what? What about the social stress at home? And so the, the schools get, you know, they, they get to be a parent, you know, a guidance, a family, a, a teacher. They get the whole ball of wax, and that's a, that's a that's a big responsibility for schools. They're just not prepared to do that. So it's one of the things that affects my office probably every day. It's not every day, every other day. Is the mental health issue of people going into crisis and getting a hold of them, taking uh, taking them to the emergency room, and it seems to be a growing and growing <coughs> event. Some people feel you shouldn't fund it, you should just deal with it. Dealing with it costs more money than funding, if that makes sense, if you have a, a structure or system, but there's some reluctance to deal with the mental health. How do you feel about that? And where would you go or where would you help shepherd the country in that? <coughs> well, mental health is a big deal to me because of, because of the veterans. I mean, I, I mentioned that my son in law is on his eighth appointment. He had a college education, he's a SEAL. So, SEALs sometimes are referred to as the spoiled children in the military. But we, we do get better equipment, we, do, we get a lot of counseling before they go on deployment, a lot of counseling help when they come back. But when my when my when I drive with my son, he drives right down the middle of the road, head on a swivel, and, and you know, he's in his mind, he spent more time overseas than he has here. And that this is this is my you know my son in law and I've been a very capable man. The veterans coming back, there are a lot of issues. But I think the first issue I'm working with the VFWs around, the first issue is that not everyone's a victim. And the veterans, they got to take care of their own community-wide first. And I think APAP is the VFWs and the American Legions move from a bar-centric organization to maybe a coffee shop bar where you have senior mentors, you know, from Vietnam, from earlier earlier conflicts, you know, helping the young guys go. Because a lot of these kids, and I'll say kids. You know, they have some issues of reintegrating. So I think locally, I think we, got, we need to stand and kind of help our, our VIA community and reach out locally first. Secondly, there, there's a lot of resources in the VA. And I haven't heard any complaint across the, across the state about Fort Harrison, about the health and, and what's going on in Fort Harrison. Veterans who a lot of them complain about everything. Uh, no one complains about Fort Harrison. Uh, it's 
so I, I think that facility is probably a bomb. Mental health otherwise, yeah, it's an issue, and I, I do agree. If you if you spend the money on a program, it is more expensive than sending the check. And, uh, and the mental, the mental program is one of these things that's important because I think it's a long-term investment. Yes, sir. Ryan, there are more hot spots around the world that have U.S. interests in some way. Uh, and you could pick up a list, but in your mind, what's the single biggest foreign issue that should be occupying our attention right now? And how would you deal with it? Iran. And many of you might know that uh, I was a little reluctant about uh, Iraq. Um, I was in the policy execution business during the Iraq War, right? And it being the Acting Commander of Special Forces in Iraq in, in 2004. So I spent a lot of time with it. Iran has always been the issue. And when we, when we removed a counterbalance, at least power wise, to Iraq, Iran is flexing their muscles. And we just gave, I am convinced, Iran a nuclear weapon. We did nothing to slow down and stop the original. And that is serious. Some of the answer is energy independence. Because we can wane our influence in the Middle East and have our influence at our command and rather than being held hostage for foreign oil. But Iran is the largest threat facing this country. And I have worked with the Israelis side by side. I fought with the Israelis side by side. And my assessment is we put them in a box. And they have to go. Because their neighbor has said they will make them scorched earth. During the recent negotiations, they were referred to as the rabbit dogs. And you ask most Iranians, where are you from? And what's the answer? Persia. That's 3,000 years ago. But to many in that culture, it is Persia represents a larger influence and a larger dominance of that area. And they are the ones that are funding Al Qaeda. invest every cent in Africa. Because I don't think you can fix that. And if the Chinese, you know, the Africans rich in natural resources, you know, the, the European countries couldn't fix Africa, we couldn't fix Africa. Um, if the Chinese want to invest everything they have in, in, in Africa, so be it. And if they can fix it, I'll speak Mandarin Chinese. But I don't think they can fix it. Um, but again, it is about energy, it's about resources. You know, in, in Montana and, and this country are blessed with, with the resources where we don't need Africa, and we certainly don't need the Middle East. Yes, sir. How, how would you propose fixing health care? <coughs> Obamacare. Obamacare. I'd abandon Obamacare. I don't need to fix it. But I do think that there are, there are ways to do it. I think, I think Montana, Wyoming, Idaho, and the Dakotas. I always like pairing with North Dakota because North Dakota is doing very well. Mm -hmm. But I think if you look at tour before, and I look at the, the model of the military, when I, when I would go in, I would see a corpsman first. The corpsman couldn't handle it. The corpsman's at 30 bucks an hour. And if, I, if they couldn't handle it, I'd see a PA, they're a little more an hour. And if they couldn't handle it, I'd, I'd see a physician. And so there was a tiered system. Unless it was trauma, then you went right, right to the, the doctor. I didn't have the right to sue. Because I was getting a free service quote, but I didn't have the right to sue. 
So the port is, is a problem that we need to address. I think the co-ops are good. I think, I think cooperatives, when you look at the hospital here, the parking lot's full during the day. And it's not all patients. Most of it is billing. Because the process we have is how to bill. And there's an incentive to bill and figure it out. If you walk in the hospital right now, and someone's going to pay. Right? Someone's going to pay for it. If you have insurance and there's no Medicare, then, then that's going to pay. If you have Medicare, the hospital loves Medicare because they're gonna, that's going to defer some of the costs. But there's a service there and you have to pay for it. So who's going to pay? I like cost sharing. I like clinics that, are, that are, are free for those who need it or very, very low cost. Again, with, with, with a tiered system. I think cooperatives are good. I think the states can figure it out better than Washington. I can tell you that the fix in D.C. or Chicago or New Orleans is a lot different than Montana, where we're mostly rural. And if you go to Winnet or you know, pick two dot or, or, or pick one of the smaller, smaller cities, their challenges of just getting a doctor are immense. We try driving 160 miles, you know, just to see anything. So, I, mean, I, I think the fix really is in power system. And, and I'm, I'm pretty much a Reagan guy. That I think the states can do a better job. The federal government can do a great job on some things, but the lower you, you push authority, the better it's executed at, at the community and state level. Um, I'm Kent Colton, superintendent of school here. That's right. You started hitting towards privatization of, of schools, and I'll, I'll, we talked about that a lot. I spent a majority of my time um, um, defending public education because everything that goes wrong is back to us and all that stuff. But I want to tell you something that I, I hope you take across the state with you is that I believe graduation rates are the key and the ultimate um, statistics for schools is that uh, here in Helena, one of our high schools, Capital High School, that has over 1,300 kids, we just released the, relate, relate, uh, the rates. We're at 93.4%, the highest ever for any school in AA. And I think good things are happening in public education. And we can do it when we have the right people in the right town, the right community to back it. And so sometimes when we get all the, we want to look the other way, let's take a look back because 93.4%, is that's a, that's a pretty good rate. We want 100, but that's, that's high. And so uh, we do a good job with that. Well, and, and, I, and don't get me wrong, I, I am an, I'm an advocate for public education. And I'm also an advocate for competition. I'm also an advocate for giving you the tools you need. Uh, across, you know, across the country or across Montana, let's talk about Montana for just a second. Cell phone coverage. Really? In Montana? My wife runs a couple of charities. She's down in the Amazon. She's down in, in, in Cambodia. She's calling back in Cambodia, any place in Cambodia, 4G, full broadband. Send me videos. Montana, I challenge you to get so 